Bringing together contemporary psychology and moral philosophy, the work of Christian B. Miller in character education has been tremendously influential. Christian Miller is the A.C. Reed Professor of Philosophy at Wake Forest University and Director of the Character Project, funded by the John Templeton Foundation and the Templeton World Charity Foundation. As well as publishing over 75 papers, Professor Miller is the author of Moral Character and Empirical Theory, Character and Moral Psychology, and The Character Gap, How Good Are We? Links to all of these works can be found on our website. In today's interview, we'll be talking to Professor Miller about his latest book, The Character Gap. In his own words, here is the predicament that most of us seem to be in. We are not virtuous people. We simply do not have characters that are good enough to qualify as honest, compassionate, wise, courageous and the like. We are not vicious people either. Dishonest, callous, foolish, cowardly and so forth. Rather, we have a mixed character, with some good sides and some bad sides. This, I have claimed, is the most plausible interpretation of what psychology today tells us. It is also true of our lived experience within the world. These are the facts as I see them. Now comes the value judgment. This is a real shame. Excellence of character or being virtuous is what we should all strive for. If you want to support the show, please go to www.patreon.com forward slash panpsychast. Thank you all. You are sincerely generous and supportive of us, and we'd like to thank everyone who's supporting us at the moment. Do something good to minimise your guilt, act out of fear, or act out of embarrassment. Whatever your reason, donate to an effective charity through the life you can save. For more information, please visit www.thepanpsychast.com forward slash charity. Links to the Patreon account and the life you can save can be found in our iTunes description. In part one, we're going to look at the character gap. And in part two, we're going to engage in some further analysis and discussion. Hello and welcome to episode 41 of the Pan Psychast. I'm the job seeking Jack Symes and I'm joined once again by the urinal fly that is Mr. Gregory Miller. Hello. And the cookie smelling professor of philosophy at Wake Forest University, Christian B. Miller. Hello. Thank you for joining us on the show today, Christian. I'm really honored to be on your show. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Awesome. Should we jump straight into the first question? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's jump straight in. So the first question we ask all of our guests, and our listeners won't be surprised to hear it, is what is philosophy? So I I think of uh, philosophy this way. First of all, we want to make a couple caveats or preliminary remarks. Philosophy, the nature of philosophy has changed over time. There's how we think of philosophy today, and then how it was thought of a long time ago in the ancient period, and there was how philosophy thought, say, in the 16th and 17th centuries. Those are very different conceptions of philosophy. I'm just going to approach the topic of philosophy as I understand it today as a contemporary practitioner. And then secondly, I don't have any kind of rigorous analysis to give. I think actually that attempt to give of necessary and sufficient conditions for what philosophy is or a strict definition or an account like that is probably going to be hopeless. You're going to find counterexamples to any proposal that's offered. Hmm. So instead, let me just give you some general thoughts or some of my own lived experience being a philosopher. I kind of distinguish between living in the world and engaging in the world versus stepping back from something we're doing and meta philosophizing or meta theorizing or meta representing what we're doing that's very abstract so let me give some examples if you're a mathematician you're engaging in math you're practicing math you're doing two plus two equals four and a whole lot more than that if you're a philosopher of mathematics so you're You're not engaging in math itself. You're not doing math per se. You're stepping Mm. back and doing a second order reflection on what's happening in mathematics. So what is a number in the first place? Do numbers actually exist? Are they objectively real or are they human constructions? Those aren't questions mathematicians would answer or or address. Those are questions that philosophers of of mathematics stepping back and reflecting on mathematics would raise. Similarly, if we shift, say, to aesthetics, there are people who are creating b- beautiful paintings or beautiful works of art. Those are artists. Those aren't philosophers in the first instance. But then a philosopher can come along and reflect upon that practice, or an artist, him or herself, can step back and reflect upon what they're doing and say, 
is there something objectively beautiful about this, for instance? Or is this all just a matter of beauty being the eye of the beholder? Coming closer to home in my own case, I'm an ethicist and a philosopher of religion. Those are my uh, kind of two areas of philosophy that I work in. In the case of ethics, well, every day of our lives, we're making moral choices, we're faced with some challenging questions. That's living as a moral agent in the world. But of course, we can step back from that as philosophers and raise, you know, philosophical questions. Is there any truth to the matter about morality? Is morality just a uh, social construction? Or is there an objective truth that governs all human beings? Similarly, our last example I'll give is in the case of religion. People, billions of people around the world are religious. They engage in religious practices. But of course, you can step back either as a religious believer or someone who's not and think about what's going on in those religious practices and ask questions like, does God even exist or do gods exist? Uh, what is the import or worth of these religious practices and similar philosophical questions about religion. So I distinguish to sum it up between the lived experience in the world and then our philosophical reflection on that lived experience. Mm -hmm. So philosophy is the kind of stepped back reflective look on our lived experience of the world and in all its facets and kind of variety. But then if that's your conception of philosophy, do you think, and it's another big question that people ask about philosophy is, well, do you think then philosophy makes some sort of progress? I, I do. Uh, so it's not just, and that's a really good point to raise, uh, it's not just the mere reflecting. So it's not mm. just the raising of questions. And one of your, one of your previous guests, Daniel Dennett, said that philosophy is primarily a matter of raising questions. And that's mm -hmm. partially what philosophy is in that re reflective process. But I don't think it's entirely what it is. It's re raising really good reflective questions with the aim of trying to develop solid, well-justified, well-supported answers to those questions as well. Now, on the question of progress specifically, how are we doing on answering those questions? Well, I think there are different ways to measure progress. Have we come up with, you know, knock down 100% certain answers to lots of big philosophical questions? Mm. So, uh, no, of course not, but that's setting the bar too high. If that's supposed to be the bar that we're supposed to meet, well, then lots of other disciplines aren't doing a very good job uh, making progress either. If, on the other hand, we're, we have other kind of criteria of progress, things like, have we made, have, have we gotten clearer on what the questions are? Have we got mm -hmm. clearer on what some of the key concepts are? Mm -hmm. Have we distinguished better what some of the answers could be to those questions? So mm -hmm. instead of saying there's only one answer or two answers, mm -hmm. have we kind of mapped the terrain of answers to those questions better? And have we done a better job of doing cost-benefit analysis? So seeing what some of the strengths and weaknesses of those answers are. I think on all, all those dimensions, on all those criteria, the answer is confidently yes, we have made progress. And then we, you know, at the end of the day, ultimately it's going to be up to each individual person or philosopher to assess those answers and do the cost-benefit for him or herself and see which answer is most reasonable to adopt. Mm -hmm. We mentioned in the introduction the amount of papers and work you've done in the field of philosophy. How is it that you first got into the subject? How, what sparked your interest? Uh, a long time ago, this was back in my high school uh, in, in America, my high school years, I started reading some philosophy religion. Uh, I came across some authors who I would say are kind of at the intersection of religion and philosophy, people like um, C.S. Lewis, for example, uh, uh, others at his time like J.R. Tolkien, and they raised interesting questions for me as uh, thinking about religious matters, which I was doing at the time. I was kind of struggling with religious questions. Mm -hmm. But then they also provide me with my first real taste of philosophy. And from there, I was just hooked kind of right away. The, the next big step in my, in my uh, kind of falling in love with philosophy was that in high school, I ran out of classes to take at my school. So I went over to a local college and there I, enrolled in Introduction to Philosophy with a professor whose name is so legendary, I have to, to say what it is. His name is Dr. Bible. Um, so I took uh, <laughs> Introduction to Philosophy with Dr. Bible, and he was, you know, just a, sec a secular introduction to uh, the main topics of philosophy. And that was my first formal training, and I became, uh, you know, a convert, if you want to continue the Dr. Bible theme here. Um, I, be I just became uh, someone who saw myself engaging with these questions as a lifelong pursuit. 
Hmm. Ended up taking several more classes with him in high school. And by the time I graduated high school and went off to college, I felt very confident that the academic life was for me. And then in, in Princeton, where I went to, to college, had a chance to work with some really, um, really prominent philosophers, and that just kind of solidified my love for philosophy. Other than uh, Tolkien or C.S. Lewis, then, can you remember what the first, uh, let's say, strictly philosophical text you read was? So m lots of undergraduates these days first come across philosophy by reading the Meditations, for example. Can you remember what your first was? Yes, I can. Uh, it took me a little bit to think back. It's been many years now, and things are a little bit foggy and cloudy in my mind. But <laughs> uh, thinking back, I now remember what it was, and that was Plato's Republic. Ah, so, me too. Where are we going? <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know why that I came across that. Maybe Dr. Bible or someone else at the time recommended it to me, uh, but it was a great recommendation. As opposed to, say, reading Aristotle as my first you know, exposure, mm -hmm. even though Aristotle might have said things that I might now agree with more than Plato, Aristotle is very dry and kind of mechanical and mm -hmm. not very fun to read. Plato was a great person to read as, for the first time. The Republic, you just kind of get swept away by the dialogue between Socrates and his interlocutors and the big questions that are raised and, you know, powerful images like the Ring of Gyges mm -hmm. and the cave and so forth. So I, I thought this is, this is not only philosophically interesting, but it, it's just uh, powerful existentially. Just, uh, I was kind of gripped by it and moved by it and uh, swept along by the story. Agreed. Um, I think for a lot of our listeners who are A-level students, it would have been well, at least looking at Plato and looking at the Republic as their first text, because it's the first thing they look at in the OCR Religious Studies A-level in the UK. And our first episode is on Plato's Cave as well, mm. where we look at the Republic. Very good. Um, but, um, but so all these aspiring philosophers listening to the show, have you got any advice for them? What would you say to yourself if you could look back at, at yourself when you first took uh, Dr. Bible's philosophy class? Um so it would really depend on what stage they're at. Um, so you can be an aspiring philosopher who's in high school or just starting out. You can be an aspiring philosopher who's a philosophy major at a college, for example. You can mm. be an aspiring philosopher who's in graduate school mm -hmm. pursuing a PhD in philosophy. So there are different kind of kinds of advice I'd give at different steps along the way. As far as someone just starting out, I would um, I'd encourage that person to really dip into the classics for sure. Mm. People like Plato, Descartes and so forth. Get some guidance as to what's appropriate given your background and what's not appropriate. So, for mm -hmm. example, I wouldn't recommend tackling Kant or Hegel right off. You know, wait, <laughs> save that for later on. That could be uh, kind of off-putting and discouraging and keep keep people away from philosophy. So, get get some guidance about what's appropriate to start with. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I also recommend him engaging with some contemporary philosophy too. Uh, there's lots that's being written these days that's accessible that's interesting, that engages with real world problems. Uh, so that I think philosophers are doing a good job, not just writing technical, analytic, kind of uh, professional papers and books, but mm. also kind of bridging that gap between that kind of research and research that can be accessible to a broader audience. And I, I, I would commend some of that work too. Mm hmm. Well, if I any of my advice would to uh, some young philosophers would be to uh, read your most recent book, The Character Gap, because, you know, I was really compelling, as I said earlier. And, um, you know, it was a real page turn. It, it kind of had me gripped. And I kind of think if students want something to kind of get their teeth into and just kind of immediately, immediately be a, kind of presented with some in incredibly interesting uh, thoughts and ideas. Well, I think it's perfect. You're very, you're very kind of say that. And no, no, no. That, that was the it's whole honor. Of the book. Um, so the, if I could say a little bit about the, why I did this book. Um, yeah. The, I've been doing that academic research I've been talking about for a long time myself. Uh, I've been working on the topic of character for over 10 years. Yeah. And I didn't want to just do that academic research and just write for fellow academics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's really important. And, and the topic of characters is underexplored. And so it's good to bring more attention to it. But at the end of the day, I was the topic of character is so important for human beings in general, not just other mm -hmm. academics. And so I wanted to take the research we've done with the character project and the research I've personally done with the books that you mentioned already, Moral Character, and empirical theory and character and moral psychology mm -hmm. and try and uh, extract some of the big themes and make it kind of fresh and in more engaging and more interesting, but relevant 
to people's lives, especially mm -hmm. those who have no background in philosophy, no background in psychology, but care about questions like what is character? Uh, mm -hmm. How can I become a better person? What, what is happening in the world today? And how can we make the world a better place? Is that the impact on people's lives then? Is that why you think you find the kind of question of character and this sort of thing so uh, interesting and compelling then? Sure. So philosophy is a huge discipline and some mm -hmm. aspects of philosophy, I think, have more impact on people's lives than others. Uh, so I don't want to kind of pick on anyone or any particular topics, <laughs> but, you know, some, some questions like the nature of propositions or... Yeah. Um, the metaphysics of time are in intrinsically interesting and important philosophical questions, but they might not have mm. much real world bearing on how I live my life. Well, cl clearly the opposite is true in the case of moral character. So it's intrinsically interesting. That's that's remains mm -hmm. the same, but it's also extremely applicable and practical. So every day of our lives, whatever our character happens to look like, we're exhibiting yeah. moral character in the world in our, you know, in a, when we're by ourselves in our offices or, or our, our homes, when we're interacting with other, other people, uh, it's pervasive in our lives, it's important in our lives, and makes a real difference. So that's why mm. I wanted to focus on moral character. Aside from moral character, is there anything in the near future that you're looking at working on, for example? So any other aspects of uh, philosophy of religion, for instance? So the, I have two projects um, that I'm thinking of right now. One is linked to moral character so i mm -hmm. uh I, I can't i can't get around that um but it's <laughs> much more focused it's much more narrow and it has to do with the topic of honesty so and i'll, I'll say a little bit about that and then i'll come back to the philosophy of religion as well honesty is a strikingly neglected virtue in contemporary philosophy mm -hmm. and i'm not talking about people's philosophers character and, and whether they're honest or not i'm talking about the, the philosophical study of honesty so here let me quantify that as far as i know there's not been a book written on the virtue of honesty in the last 50 years in philosophy. Nor has there been an academic paper in a mainstream journal in philosophy on the virtue of honesty in the last 50 years. This is stunning, uh, especially given the explosion of work on virtue in general and virtue ethics in philosophy going back to 1970s and 80s. So I'm currently working on a book on the virtue of honesty that I hope will be done later this summer and we'll, we'll make some at least initial progress, if nothing else, it gets people interested in the topic and excited about the topic and can refine what I put out there. The uh, other side of what I'm working on, uh, you rightly said, has to do with philosophy of religion. And this has been a longstanding interest of mine going back all the way to high school. I've published here and there on philosophy of religion throughout the years, say on the questions of God and morality, what's the relationship between the two, if there is any at all, uh, questions of is religious belief beneficial? So not whether it's true or not, or whether there's good mm -hmm. evidence for not, but is it actually beneficial, harmful to be a religious mm -hmm. believer? And so moving forward, a um, natural application of what I've done on the topic of character is to think more about um, religious approaches to character. Mm -hmm. Because after all, um, religions have had lots to say. Now, I'm not privileging any one particular religion, just religions in general have had lots to say about the topic of character for thousands of years. And I like to explore more what they have to say, whether it's... Um, can be extracted and used in a secular context, or whether some of those ideas are uh, uh, intimately bound up with the religion and cannot be extracted. Well, you, you go into this in the final chapter of the book, don't you? The divine assistance and how it can help us uh, develop our character. So we'll get onto that later on. But for now, I think, should we jump into part one where we can look at the character gap itself? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Part one, the character gap. So before we start talking about the character gap, I think a good place to start is with these ideas of virtue and character. Uh, Christian, could you explain to us what you mean by these terms, character and virtue? Sure, I'd love to. So let's start with character, and then virtue is a subset of character. So let's do the, the mm -hmm. broad concept, and then we'll do the narrower concept. I'm focusing specifically on moral character. I should say that right up front. There are different kinds of character. There's um, character that has to do with uh, you know, intellectual matters, there's character that has to do with uh, athletic matters, there's character that has to do with uh, artistic matters. Mm -hmm. But my focus is clearly on moral questions. So moral character I think of as kind of your moral fiber. It's how you're disposed to think, feel, and act when it comes to moral issues, questions, 
and topics. So that's mm -hmm. still pretty abstract. Let me try and make it a little bit more concrete. Uh, uh, moral character is your disposition. So how you kind of approach the world and see the world, then how you think, how you feel, and how you act. So an honest person, for example, we just talked about honesty some, uh, is disposed to think in an honest way. So mm -hmm. believe it's important to tell the truth, believe it's important to not lie, believe it's important to not steal, for example. To have honest feelings, so be motivated by care for the truth, mm -hmm. care for not stealing, care for not lying and cheating and so forth. And then those thoughts and feelings give rise to honest behavior. So it's kind mm -hmm. of a step-by-step -step process, the disposition, which then gives rise to the thoughts and the feelings, and those in turn can give rise to the behavior, honest behavior, not cheating, not lying, not stealing, but instead telling the truth, for example. So with that said about character, the virtues are a subset of character, honesty being a paradigm example of the virtues, but they're not the only kind of character traits out there. Of course, there are the vices too. Hmm. So <laughs> sticking with the virtues in the first instance, these are the morally admirable, the morally intrinsically good character traits. The vices are the opposite. Examples of moral virtues include honesty, compassion, uh, courage, graciousness, gratitude, uh, forgiveness, and so forth. And then we know the, the opposing vices to those. Virtues uh, as a kind of broad matter, or a, a, just to say some, some general characteristics of virtues, they're intrinsically good, morally speaking. Uh, they lead give give rise to cross-situationally consistent behavior. That's kind of fancy mm -hmm. lingo for mm -hmm. saying that a virtuous person acts in a variety of situations relevant to the virtues. Mm -hmm. So an honest person doesn't just tell the truth in the courtroom and never anywhere else, but is honest in a variety of situations where telling the truth can come into question. Yeah. They uh, are stable over time. The virtues are stable over time. So it's not just that the honest person is honest today and never again. No, they're honest consistently day after day after day after day. So they're stable over time, consistent across situations, behaving well, and for the right reasons, the right uh, virtuous motives and reasons behind that behavior. Okay. So if an honest, you couldn't be an honest person and only be motivated by wanting to make a good impression on others. Or uh, you know, enhancing your resume, or mm -hmm. uh, may, you know, not, uh, not getting punished. Those are some features of a virtue. Mm. Uh, could you give us some examples of, or perhaps one example, just of someone who think who you think has a has a virtue within their character? Sure. Someone in history I, or contemporarily. I can give you a, a couple examples. Uh, so I think one pretty uncontroversial example is Abraham Lincoln, mm. so the, the American president, with respect to the virtue of honesty. Now, I should note, it's going to be hard to find examples of people who are virtuous across the board. Uh, every example we can think of, there are going to be some flaws as well as some virtues. But uh, Abraham Lincoln, with respect to the virtue of honesty, I think is a paradigm example. Uh, he was famous for, i give you a concrete example, uh, when he was managing a shop and somewhat, he had given the incorrect change to a customer. At the end of the day, he closed down the shop and walked miles to that customer's house to give that customer the correct change, even though it was a small amount. He, he uh, another example, was willing to lose a court case when he was a lawyer uh, because he discovered that his case was indefensible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not, not many lawyers were, I shouldn't be so quick to say that, but <laughs> some lawyers, at least today, wouldn't uh, be willing to do that. But he was willing to say, look, the honest thing is to be is to be forthcoming that this case mm. is indefensible. I'm going to lose the case, but it's the right thing to do. So that would be an example of honesty. We could shift to other uh, uh, virtues as well. Harriet Tubman, I think, is a good example of courage. Uh, mm. In the book, I talk about people like Paul Farmer, the, con the, uh, the contemporary uh, leader of Partners in Health, who is a mm. uh, wonderful example of compassion. And there are others, too. Can, uh, are there any uh, kind of pertinent examples of uh, uh, characters of vice, then, that you... Uh typically employ as yeah. well. So that's arguably easier to come up with. Uh, the, yes. <laughs> the history of you know civilization is gives us plenty of uh, examples and we can come up with some contemporary ones too. But uh, I mean, the, this, the kind of stock easy examples are people like Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, uh, people who are, are 
well known for their cruelty, um, for their intolerance, um, for their callousness. Uh, those kind of vices uh, come to mind immediately. So I think it's pretty, uh, pretty safe to say that the 20th century gives us plenty of examples of vicious people. Mm, I think that's true. Um, okay, so we have these examples of people that are virtuous and people that are vicious, let's say. But um, one of the big questions you first address in the book is, well, why should we uh, bother developing a good character? Why should we see these people and go, that's the sort of thing we should be? I mean, it's a, like a really important question because we can study this all we want as a philosophical matter, mm. but at the end of the day, who cares? I mean, why, why is it personally important to my life? And I want readers to come away with a sense that this isn't just an academic exercise we're engaged with and when we're thinking about the nature of character and what it looks like today, but it's actually something that really matters a great deal to our personal lives. Mm -hmm. And so in chapter two, I talk about several reasons why I think it matters. They are stronger and weaker reasons, and some reasons I mm -hmm. acknowledge may appeal to people more than other reasons. My attempt isn't to prove anything, but let me just uh, highlight a few of them. One reason is self-interested. Mm -hmm. This might not be the best reason to promote virtue, but I think it's the reason we need to put out there. So it, it, there's good reason, there's good evidence, there's good research backing up the point that if you improve in character, you become more virtuous, it's actually going to benefit you in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So these are studies done in psychology finding relationships between virtues like gratitude mm. and on the other hand, things we care about like uh, uh, in in increased performance on tasks, uh, mm. increased mood, decreased depression, uh, greater uh, subjective well-being and contentment with life, deeper purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, a really interesting way to pursue the question of why I care about character. If we stop there though, and we made it just about mm. self-interest, and what benefits ourselves, I think we should be dissatisfied with that. Uh, yeah. After all, we're talking about virtue, and virtue isn't just a matter of trying to benefit yourself. It's Virtue often involves looking outside of yourselves and caring about others for their own sake, say the virtue mm. of compassion. But I want to highlight that one first because for some people, that's going to be the most impactful reason. Um, right. where, they, where they happen to be in their lives, uh, finding out that this can actually benefit them will maybe uh, get them to pay more attention to it or take it more seriously. Do you think, just to jump in here, do you think this is a, so you mentioned, I think you give the example of the car in the book on this, don't you? So we have the destination of, of becoming virtuous and as a byproduct, you know, I enjoy the wind in my hair and there's a great song by you 2 on the radio <laughs> and I can enjoy that along the way. Um, but this seems to be what you describe as the, the egotistic approach. We just do it for our own sake, our own end. And earlier, the only note I've jotted down so far from our discussion is we need to do be, develop virtue for the right reasons. That's correct. So, That's correct. Do, do, you, so is this, do you think this is the least best reason out of the four you give in the book? So it, it is that the least best and for precisely this reason, because if mm -hmm. we just stayed at that level, we wouldn't be able to become virtuous, right? If it was, mm -hmm. it was just I'm helping others so that I can benefit myself because I can make myself feel better or imp increase my mood. That's not a virtuous reason for helping others. And so we would not be able to qualify as virtuous. But my hope is that it might be something that might push us into seeing the world differently and, and behaving differently. And then over time, our perspective can change. So we might, you know, volunteer more than we have in the past. Mm -hmm. And we might be volunteering in initially for more self-interested reasons. But then the more time we spend helping people in need and seeing what's going on with their situation, our perspective can start to change. And we can say, wow, this is really important, the work I'm doing here. And these people are, are, you know, are in a bad shape. Um, there's something I can do to help their situation improve a little bit, uh, regardless of whether I benefit or not. So my motivation over time can evolve from being primarily focused on myself to slowly, gradually focusing on others. Mm. And that gets us on the path to virtue. So uh, other reasons. Another reason, uh, I think, to care about character mm -hmm. is a religious reason. Uh, so all the religions I know of throughout the world think character is important. They don't say having a mediocre character is good enough, you know, that you're fine if you just have a mediocre character. They expect good character that might look differently from religion to religion, but it's a, uh, I often, uh, 
a very prominent expectation of those religions. Mm -hmm. So for the people who are religious, they have an extra reason. What about people who are not religious? Well, here's a, a third consideration. Being virtuous, I think, just makes the world a much better place. Uh, it makes our communities better, makes mm -hmm. our societies better, and it makes the world at large better. So I want to live in a world where there's more honesty, where there's more compassion, where there's more justice, mm -hmm. and don't most people as well. So this is a, a third reason that uh, the world in general, not just because I'll benefit, mm -hmm. because society will benefit and yeah. our communities will benefit with the presence of virtue in those places. Yes. And then finally, the last one I'll, I'll give and I'll stop uh, is an emotional reason. So mm -hmm. I don't want to just treat this as a purely intellectual matter. I want to also think mm -hmm. about what kind of emotionally inspire us. And this goes back to the stories of powerful role models. People we've already mentioned, like Abraham Lincoln or Paul Farmer, or uh, Leopold Sosha, who was a, mm -hmm. uh, a um, sewer worker in Poland during World War II. Mm -hmm. And he was responsible for protecting 20 Jews in his so sewer system during World War II after the Nazis had invaded his town. For over a year, he hid those Jews in his sewer system, every day having to go on his crawl on his hands and knees through the filthy sewer pipes to bring them food and water mm -hmm. so that they would survive until the Russians eventually invaded and liberated the town. Seeing a story like that, that can have an, a powerful emotional impact on people. I, I mean, it mm -hmm. certainly does on me, and I hope it does on others too. Now, this is someone who I just emotionally admire, and I want mm -hmm. to be more like him. So this is the idea of being inspired or elevated, the, the psychologist's Heights talks about the idea of elevation uh, mm -hmm. that we want. We see someone who we admire, and then that triggers in us an emotional response of wanting to model our lives more like that person. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, at the end of the day, might be the most powerful reason of all. Um, just to give my my analysis, me and Greg we were, were talking until the early hours of the morning yesterday on these four issues, and we're trying to, to pin out which ones we think are the best reasons, because we certainly felt emotionally motivated when reading the book, and mm -hmm. the examples you use are, are brilliant, and they, I think that's the great thing about the book, is that it, it's so colourful in the examples and experiments that you use. Now, I want to touch, before the overall um, analysis of the reasons, the third one, God wants us to become good people. And you, you say, oh, okay, if you're a religious believer, if you just mentioned, here's a really good reason for developing virtue because God wants you to do that. Mm -hmm. It's about building that relationship with God. And then, okay, so if I'm an atheist or an agnostic, either the listener might be thinking, oh, well, forget that one. I don't need to think about that. But you give this kind of Pascal's wager-esque um, response to that. Do you want to un unpack that for the listener for sure. us? Sure. And I, I give it quickly, and I don't mean it to be anything other than suggestive. It's no, it's no worked out, detailed argument. But here's the thought. Uh, look, even if you're not religious, um, mm -hmm. it's, there's no proof out there these days that God does not exist. So I think atheists and, and theistic or religious philosophers can agree that no one has succeeded in proving the non-existence of God. Mm -hmm. they might have, there might be some strong arguments against the existence of God, but none that rise to the level of proof. So there's, there's a chance, and a non-trivial chance, that God exists. If that's the case, and then we're talking about a, a God kind of familiar to uh, most religious believers in the West, a kind of uh, you know, theistic God who cares about the good and wants people to live a good life, well, then there's a non-trivial chance that this God exists who wants us to be good people. Mm -hmm. And if that's right, then maybe we should care about being good people in light of this non-trivial chance of this God existing. Now, again, I don't want to put too much emphasis on this or too much weight on it, but I think uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting line of thought um, mm -hmm. worth considering, and it raises all kinds of, of further questions. It mm -hmm. does, and I'm, I'm, it's interesting to hear you say that it, it's not a fully fledged out argument, and because um, I think that's in the nature of the book as well. You don't want to bog down the reader with too much difficult, challenging philosophy. You don't want to break it down to premises and a conclusion. Right. It's not exactly going to um, sell sell the book, and, and be interesting and engaging. Now, I think perhaps I think Dawkins is spaghetti monster or the great pumpkin. So I can't rule out the existence of the spaghetti monster or the great pumpkin, but I still want to eat spaghetti. I'm not going to stop eating spaghetti for dinner right. and, and pumpkins at Halloween. So 
you know, should I, I can't rule out these? Should I really live my life in accordance with principles by something I can't disprove? What do you think of this line of? Like, yeah, like um, I think it's a, it's a it's a fair point to raise. Um, so by itself, this these kinds of arguments uh, will leave us with lots of possibilities and not much way to sort through the possibilities, and it they need to be supplemented by some evidence. Mm -hmm. which is now going beyond their normal kind of style of argumentation. So that there needs to be some consideration of, is there any ar evidence at all for the spaghetti monster? Is there any evidence at all for the theistic God? Mm -hmm. Well, let's just take those two. On the one hand, the first case, no evidence at all for the spaghetti monster. In this mm -hmm. case of the theistic God, uh, well, there's some evidence. You might say it's not very strong, you might say it's weak or however, but at least there's some evidence for the theistic God, no evidence for the other. So that means that this one possibility should be taken more seriously than the other. Good. So mm -hmm. it links in with, with my other question about the four reasons. I think that's a very good response to the question, I might add. But these seem to be pragmatic reasons for one living virtuously and not perhaps they're not moral oughts. Uh, you mentioned earlier objective moral values, and that's something you're interested in as well. So is there a moral ought that we ought to make the world better or that we ought to enjoy our lives so that we ought to get to heaven? Is there something to motivate one's um, ethical life? Yeah, so so on the question of the foundations of morality, I mm. largely dodged that question in the book. You do. Uh, so you're, you're quite right to call me out on that here. Uh, and that, that's, that's quite fair, and that was intentional uh, mm. for... A couple of reasons. One, it would have just made the book longer. Uh, it would have made it more complicated. We would have had to kind of sort through the different positions and so forth. But two, I was hoping I could um, say enough that would appeal to people regardless of their broader, what you say, they use the word metaethical or right. foundational commitments about morality. Yeah. So let me expand on what I mean there. Um, look, if you think morality comes from God or you think that there's an objective morality that just exists on its own with no supernatural foundation, or you think that, um, uh, th that morality is constructed in various ways, regardless of those debates, don't you think that honesty is important, right? Mm -hmm. That honesty is a virtue, and honesty is something that we should care about. And if it turns out that many of us are not honest people, can't you agree that we should try and find concrete steps and strategies and procedures for trying to bridge the gap between how we actually are and the virtue of honesty? Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping we can carry out that kind of discussion of character without having to engage the question of what is the objective moral status of the virtue of honesty? It's a really important mm -hmm. question, but I didn't want to lose any readers uh, or get bogged down in that in a mm -hmm. kind of non-academic book meant to uh, reach a larger audience. Mm. I think that's a great credit to the book um, as, as well. I, I, I was able to plug in any ethical view, I think, that, I, I, that I've studied and think, ah, I could be a utilitarian here, or I could be a Kantian, or I could, I could believe in God, and it kind of it works for all of them. And there's, there's very, there's a couple of occasions where you mention your own, your own view, such as, oh, sometimes the ends don't justify the means of getting there. But the, they're always flagpoled as, oh, this is what I think, but you know, this doesn't, this isn't mean that this is incompatible with utilitarianism or something like that. Right. It, that, that was the hope. That was, that was what I was uh, striving for and aiming mm -hmm. for. And I'm glad to hear that it seemed to, to work in this case. Um, I have plenty to say about the foundations of morality. It's not like I, I don't want to engage with that discussion. I just was trying to be strategic about it. Yeah, that's wise. Um, so one of the key themes in the book, and uh, let's say one of the key characters is Frank. Now, Frank is this uh, character used to illustrate, in a sense, the, how we are all neither morally virtuous or neither morally vicious. We're kind of this mixed middle ground, as you say, and this is what you call the character gap. Could you, for example, run us through some of the reasons you think that we don't, for instance, have the uh, virtue of helping or the virtue of um, being compassionate, where, but yet at the same time, we also don't have the vice of being deceitful or being harmful, for instance. Sure, I'd love to. So, it, you you got the view exactly right. Um, it's, the picture is of our actual character now. We're switching away from philosophy and getting more into the realm of psychology. Mm. And I can't, as a philosopher, talk about our actual character just by pontificating from my armchair. I need some kind of real data to work with. So I mm. turn to psychological studies to help inform my picture of actual character. And the conclusion I arrived at is that our actual character 
for the most part, for most people, it's a bell curve, so it's not going to apply to everyone, but for most mm. people, it's a mixed bag of some good tendencies and some bad tendencies, but such that we're not good enough to qualify as virtuous, we're not bad enough to qualify as vicious. So to make that more concrete, we can look at some studies. How do you want to go? Do you want to you want the good side first? Or you want the bad side first? Oh, we start? oh let's let's see how how terrible we are. Really. <laughs> oh no, because okay. they're the really shocking ones, aren't they? <laughs> okay, yeah, the really shocking ones. <laughs> they're the ones that really grab you. you go, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> let's get that out of the way then. Um, and and let's focus on the case of helping to begin with. Yeah. So, so there's there are a couple famous ones in the history of psychology. One is the Milgram shock experiments from the 1960s. Mm. These were um, studies where a participant was brought into the lab, sat down at a desk, told that there's a shock dial that you have to turn up the shock every time that someone in the next room gets a wrong answer. Mm -hmm. So the participant would be administering a test to someone in the next room, be seeing how the person was doing. Every time there's a wrong answer, you'd have to turn up this dial and give a little bit more shock, a little bit more shock, a little bit more shock mm -hmm. to someone in the next room. The uh, initial element of this is that there's an authority figure standing behind the participants, looking mm. very you know, official and uh, with a, a kind of scientific uh, persona uh, going on. Mm. As time went on, this was all rigged, of course, so there'd be lots of wrong answers. There was no actual mm. shocking. It's important to be clear about that. But the participant <laughs> didn't know that, any of this. This was all behind the scenes. As time went on, the shocks were getting more and more painful. What happened? The participant at any point could bail out. They could say, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. And they had that right and they could just leave. Lo and behold, uh, that was not what tended to happen. They would sometimes voice some reservations or said, do I really need to con con do this? Or can I stop or whatnot? The authority figure at that point had to follow some scripted prompts. They would say things like, please continue, or we need this, uh, we need this, re this, this result. As time went on, 66% of participants kept going and going and going up to the XXX level on the shock dial. Mm, what shocking. did that mean? Uh, shocking, yes, indeed. <laughs> very, very, uh, uh, that meant the lethal level of shock. Yeah. So, and this was not coming out of the blue, but prior to that, the participant was hearing pounding on the wall, was hearing mm. screams, was hearing the test taker say, I have a heart condition. And yes, 66% went all the way. Uh, that's uh, very disturbing. Another example. Can I, can I also, jump in with your, because uh, you give a fantastic quote, which I really am dying to read. You Because it's not just in the 60s this takes place. A part of the character project, you have a colleague at the University of Barcelona who did something similar with virtual reality. And so, so you say it's not just then, it's now. And this great quote from you here on page 93. This is worth emphasizing again. I'm not just talking about those people Milgram studied 50 years ago. I'm talking about the person walking in the office across from you or driving the cab or teaching your class or sleeping in your bed. They would most likely inflict terrible pain and potentially even kill someone if they were placed in that kind of situation. You and I would too. I think it really drums that home that this is you and I. It's scary. <laughs> I guess it applies to people uh, across the, the desk at the podcast, too. So, <laughs> um, but, no, we, we're, we're, but you, you all are the exception. So I'm talking about most people, right? It's a bell curve. Yeah. But there are some people on the virtue yeah. side, some people on the vice side. And I'm sure, I'm sure you guys are on one side. I won't say which. Um, but, <laughs> but thank you for reading that. And it's, uh, it's, 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 I'm, I still stand by that, uh, even mm. though it's terribly disturbing. I'll give you one other uh, example, and then we can shift to the, the, the better side of the story that we can feel a bit more uplifted after this depressing discussion uh also from the 1960s in light of this famous kitty genovese case that happened uh allegedly there's some controversy now about this kitty genovese case that happened in new york city two psychologists ran a study became known as the lady in distress study mm. and here they had a participant come into a room sit down fill out some paperwork a stranger also comes into the room, looks like they're another mm -hmm. participant, told to sit down, fill out the same paperwork. They're working together in the room. The person in charge leaves, goes into the next room. A few minutes later, the participants hear this crash. Sounds like a bookshelf has fallen over or there's, there's some mm -hmm. furniture that, that has fallen on top of the person in charge. She starts screaming and saying, my, my leg, my leg, uh, ouch, ouch, ouch. Uh, so something's emergency is going on. Mm -hmm. Well, what did that participant do? What would you do? I mean, when I ask people, what would you do? 
they say, I would help, right? I'd help. <laughs> Everyone says, of course, it, they, they say that. I would help. I, I would get up and I would run into the next room and I would see what was going on. Mm. Well, lo and behold, uh, it's more complicated than, than that. If that stranger in the room with you does nothing and just continues to fill out that paperwork, it's very likely you will do nothing as well. And this is what the scientists found. Only 7%, let me say it again, only 7% uh, of participants helped in any way, which means 93% didn't do anything. They just continued to do the task that they were assigned. This is uh, in some ways more disturbing than mm, Milgram mm. because in some ways less. I mean, they're, they're, they're not, there's no killing involved here. So it's obviously not more disturbing in that sense. But on the other hand, there's no authority figure either. Yeah. Mm. So in Milgram, you had the authority figure who was putting pressure on the participants to keep going. Here, there's, this was their own choice. And they, they could have easily gotten up and walked into the next room and see what was going on. They didn't. And this has been replicated as well. This is not just a one-off study. It's been mm. replicated many times in many countries with also interesting variations too, involving epileptic seizures, bullying mm -hmm. of children, stealing, smoke coming into the room. This is the bystander effect, a uh, very famous yeah. result in psychology. And you, you talk about all these psychological influences on a person, how that impacts their decisions they make, such as the role of embarrassment and how the most effective way to get someone to do something charitable or good is to, or compassionate, is to wait from outside of a bathroom because they're embarrassed and you catch them out there. And if you have um, the role of fear or authority figures in, in this Milgram and this other study and how the smell of cookies might even get you to, to do something like this or, or trying to... Um, overcome your guilt if you do something bad then suddenly later on you might do something good so do you think recognizing just actually maybe we'll get onto this in the next question but should we have some uplifting news instead should we um, in, <laughs> i think we need that what, what's the good part of our character <laughs> this is a, this is a good, good point to to have something more uplifting and i'll piggyback on what you just said uh but then get to some really good news so here's some mm. some good news but not great news and then some really good news I'm skeptical given we've just found out that 7% of people, go on. Right, right, right. So, um, so what you were studying were studies where people actually did help. Uh, and they did, you know, they did, did the admirable thing. So, for mm. example, in one study, uh, the majority of participants helped a with a simple helping task of making change for a dollar in a shopping mall. But they did this after having walked past Mrs. Fields' cookies or Cinnabons, which are places which emits you know, a very uh, wonderful smell. Mm. And what seems to be going on there is that the smell put them in a good mood, and then subsequently the helping gave them an opportunity to maintain their good mood. Mm -hmm. This is good news, but not great news, because the behavior is good, they're helping, but the motivation, the reasons behind it is not virtuous. It's to maintain yeah. their, their good mood. So... Great news now, and I, I want to put it in terms of great news. There is evidence where motivation and behavior is really excellent. And this is evidence coming from empathy research. Mm. Now, I don't want to paint a completely rosy picture of empathy. There's some challenges and questions raised about empathy too. But let me just say this. Thanks, I think, primarily to the work of the psychologist Daniel Batson, we now have very good empirical evidence that people who experience empathy for the suffering of others are much more likely to help those other people, even if they're strangers. Mm. So that's powerful behavior. So helping behavior is reliably linked to feelings of empathy. But there's more to it than that. What about the motivation? Is it just that kind mm -hmm. of self-interested motivation again? No. Batson's found over the course of 30 years, and there's there are all kinds of ways he found this, and we could get into the details if you like, but he found that there's excellent reason to think that the motivation is altruistic, hmm. not egoistic. It's selfless as opposed to self-centered motivation to help alleviate the suffering of others when you feel empathy for their suffering. Yeah. This, I think, is a, is a wonderful uh, avenue to consider in trying to develop the virtue of compassion because compassion person helps and helps selflessly or altruistically. Good. Mm -hmm. What you've given us there still is that I, I presume you you won't take issue if I state that the majority of our actions are egotistic. And for that reason, we might say that, I mean, on the cover of your book here, we've got we've got Hitler at the bottom and Gandhi at the top. More people are, <laughs> I never thought I'd say this, closer to Hitler than they are Gandhi. They, they seem to 
more seven percent of people helped and is it around 70 percent of people that shocked to like a lethal right. point in the milgram experiment so how can we given our mixed characters and given that we have so many vices or we don't um we haven't cultivated virtues enough most people anyway how can we bridge what you call the character gap we we ought or we should strive to have these virtues mm -hmm. but quite clearly from these studies you've just cited we certainly most people certainly don't how can we expect people or, or how, what are the approaches we can do to bridge the gap great 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 let me a couple of quick qualifiers to what you said and then uh let's get into some of the strategies mm -hmm. so um i don't know I, I don't know right now whether most people are closer to the vice side or to the virtue side. Yeah. Um, it's quite true that some of these studies are very depressing and show kind of quite bad behavior, but then I think we need to counterbalance it with some, some positive results too, like the empathy research. So mm. all I want to commit myself to is that we're in this murky middle, this, this middle mm. space uh, between virtue and vice, and that's enough to still make the mm. point that bridging the character gap is really important. We should uh, strive mm. to do better. Um, so having said that, if I had just ended the book with, here's how we are, um, sorry, you know, we're this murky middle, uh, see you later, that would have been a, a kind of <laughs> not, not, not very uh, encouraging thing to end with. But in part three, the final chapter, uh, final, I'm sorry, section of the book, I try to give some strategies that give us hope that we can do better. We can come closer to that ideal uh, virtue. Hmm. Uh, in those chapters, there are three of them. I first talk about some strategies which I don't think are very promising, and I, I kind of set them to one side, and then I turn to some strategies which I think are more promising. I nowhere say that there's only one golden strategy that everyone has to follow. I don't think that's hmm. true. I think there are multiple approaches, and that they are not exclusive. So you can kind of pick and choose from them or could combine them in interesting ways. But why don't we turn to them, um, a couple of them specifically and, and dive into them. So trying to find, if one doesn't already have, I think most of us can easily find good role models in our lives of moral virtue mm -hmm. and then trying to intentionally emulate those role models. So these can be historical individuals from the past, like Abraham Lincoln. Uh, they can be contemporary people. They could be even fictional people. Mm. Uh, so from, from powerful works of fiction that, we, uh, that have moved us, or they can be real people. They can be famous celebrities, or probably not too many celebrities today are, are <laughs> uh, exemplars of virtue, but you know, f some, some famous people today, or they can be people who um, uh, are right down the street from our house, or who are working our building uh, and, and the like. It's not so important um, to me who they are. It's important that they are there and that we look to them and we strive to be more like them. Now, it's certainly true that psychologically, the more they are involved in our lives, in our day-to-day -day lives, are going to have more of an impact. But the idea is we admire them and we want to emulate them, and that can set us on the road to becoming more like them virtuously. Second strategy uh, is one where we, we think about moral reminders. Now... In life, it seems like there are many things that are pulling for our attention. We can be distracted by a number of different considerations. Sometimes those competing factors or forces can take us off a moral path. We can get really consumed with our own self-interest, for instance. I think moral reminders are a great way to get us back on track, to get our perspective reoriented to what really matters. These can take a variety of different forms. They can be really concrete reminders like uh, particular jewelry you wear, uh, uh, something around your neck or on your arm, tattoos or body art or whatnot. They can be mm -hmm. daily readings that you have implemented in your life that kind of start your day on the right footing. Um, they can be text messages that you program to get at intervals mm -hmm. uh, three times a day. So that's what I have in mind. And the research suggests that these can be pretty impactful. Mm. So to give you uh, one illustration from the research literature on the role of moral reminders, in research on cheating, there was uh, some really fascinating studies involving uh, an opportunity to cheat on a test where people would get paid 50 cents per correct answer. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the test, they would grade the test themselves, shred their materials, and just report how many they got correct. In that kind of setup, it was found that people were quite willing to cheat. 
and inflate their number of correct, in quotation marks, answers. Yeah. However, a different group, when they were given a moral reminder, then took the same test with the same monetary incentive and the same opportunity to shred and verbally report, cheating disappeared completely. And those were more, more reminders took different forms. They could be the moral reminder of uh, uh, recall as many of the Ten Commandments as you can. That was one that mm -hmm. the researchers used. Another one was for students, uh, sign your honor code. They had to sign their mm -hmm. school's honor code, and then they took the test. So there could be different forms of a moral reminder, but the effect was the same. So I think mm -hmm. moral reminders are a second strategy to really uh, give some thought to. And then the last one, and I'll stop it because I've gone on for a while here, uh, is what I call getting the word out. Mm. And this mm. is basically uh, just kind of education, if you want to boil it down to one word, it's education. It's learning more about our psychology, and especially some of the unconscious or at least not as well recognized psychological influences on our behavior, mm -hmm. which keep us from being virtuous. We can uh, connect back to our earlier discussion of the uh, bystander effect here, for example. Mm. Mm -hmm. So uh, people, uh, you know, understandably myself as well, don't often understand the impact that being in a group can have on helping and not helping. Mm -hmm. That if we're in a group where no one else is helping, we're very likely not going to help ourselves, even if we see an emergency going on. Well, if we start to become more familiar with the psychological phenomena, we not saying you have to read the actual psychological studies, but just learn about it, uh, what's going on through you know, popular books or podcasts or articles or mm -hmm. other ways this gets transmitted, uh, then we can be more on guard against this influence. Mm -hmm. And the next time we're in a group setting and we see someone getting uh, taken advantage of or hurt or whatnot, we get, and we see no one else doing anything, we can remind ourselves, wait a minute, mm. that person's needs are more important than how I look to the group, yeah. whether I embarrass myself in front of the group. Good. So this is a concrete uh, illustration of the importance of education. And there is some research to back up this approach as well. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sci Cast. The next installment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pansai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash PansaiCast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. Thanks. That was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. That was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Okay. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>